Deep in the desert southwest, there lies an extraordinary tourist stop, a destination point for thousands of people every year. Roswell, New Mexico, a place with great hiking, abundant fishing, and a remarkable story. Some people believe this is the site where a flying saucer fell from the sky in the summer of 1947. It's a small town with a big mystery that won't go away. Join us now on a journey to Roswell, New Mexico. Roswell, New Mexico is by anyone's definition a nice place to visit. And as some will tell you, an even better place to live. With wide open spaces just whistling with fresh air. Will Rogers said that Roswell was the prettiest town in the West. And I agree with him. Uh, Roswell's not a small community, and it's not a big city. It's just right. Located about 250 miles southeast of Albuquerque, Roswell is a place where you can ski at Easter and play golf in December. If you're a person that likes outdoor activities, you're going to love it here in Roswell because we offer many different things to do, whether it's up to the mountains or down to Carlsbad Caverns. We have some great golf courses here, and it's the kind of things that you can do year round. During World War II and throughout most of the Cold War, Roswell was the site of Walker Air Force Base, one of the largest installations operated by the Strategic Air Command. But the base was closed in 1967, and today it has been converted into a civilian air center. So now, besides great weather and its proximity to outdoor fun, Roswell is known for dairy herds, green chili peppers, and down-to-earth people. Then, of course, there's what locals call the incident. In fact, the incident is what Roswell is most famous for. It's the main reason this town of only 49,000 residents is visited by hundreds of thousands of tourists each year. From all over the world, they come to visit the spot where a mysterious event took place more than 50 years ago. The Roswell incident is one that just will not die. It's a fascinating incident because we know that there was an Air Force cover-up there. And so when people talk about cover-ups, this is a case where there really was one. The Roswell story has taken on epic proportions of mythology because, and here's the real story, it really became a story in the 70s with the publication of mass books and magazine articles and so on that launched it into the public consciousness. The Roswell story is one pieced together from newspaper accounts at the time, reports issued years later by the U.S. government, and from people who claim to have been eyewitnesses that night. No matter what the source, all accounts agree something mysterious happened that night. There was an explosion. There was a sound that didn't resemble the regular thunder. Well, the night of July 7th, we was doing our nightly chores, and Dad said, my gosh, what made that bright light? And we looked up, and we could just see that object going over. They looked up, and they heard a noise. And there was a bright light and a crash. And they thought, oh my god, a plane had just crashed. Somebody needs help. The year was 1947. The town of Roswell, New Mexico, was getting ready to celebrate a long 4th of July weekend when, out of a stormy night sky, eyewitnesses claimed they saw something extraordinary plunge to Earth. And whatever it was, it did not look like anything they had ever seen before. By all accounts, the first one on the scene was a ranch foreman named Mac Brazel. He had heard the crash too and then rode out to check on his livestock. He goes out and he finds this area, half to three quarters of a mile long, a few hundred feet wide, with very strange wreckage. 
debris, call it what you want. The debris itself was and all the way from uh, three-foot pieces to little tiny pieces. An aluminum-colored material seemed to be the general description of it. He started to examine the material and noticed that it also displayed characteristics that were, to his impression, far superior to anything that we had at that time. UFO author Don Schmidt has spent years examining the Roswell incident. He has co-written two books about it and interviewed dozens of people who claim to be first-hand witnesses. Their stories, Schmidt believes, support Mac Brazel. He would hold pieces of material that felt weightless in his hands, paper thin, and yet you couldn't bend it, you couldn't crease it. He would pull out his lighter and he would try to burn pieces of the material with no effect. As the story goes, Mac Brazel wanted to share his discovery with someone. The first people he told were his neighbors, the Proctors. In 1947, Loretta Proctor was 33 years old. Even now, she says she vividly remembers that day. He brought a piece of material up to show us and it was such strange looking material that we told him he ought to report it because at that time we had heard there was a reward out for anybody that found a UFO and he, he might have found one. $3,000, which was a lot of money at that time, especially for a rancher who didn't have much money. And everybody said, you ought to take it to the sheriff's office and claim the reward. So the next day, the 6th, he went into Roswell, brought some of the wreckage with him in his old pickup truck, went to the sheriff's office. Mac Brazel showed some of the wreckage he had found to Roswell Sheriff George Wilcox. After Wilcox observes some of the material, he immediately dispatches two of his deputies to drive north of town and to check out the site firsthand. Sheriff Wilcox suggested Brazel tell his story to the media. Former DJ Frank Joyce was on the air at radio station KGFL when suddenly the sheriff and Mac Brazel called in. So he started talking about a crash on his ranch and I was trying to play records and uh, he began to tell me what he had found on his ranch. This story was getting to be a little wild and I said, uh, well, go to the U.S. Army Air Corps. They are flyers and will know what to do about anything that flies. Some people suspect Roswell residents simply didn't know what they'd found. These were not sophisticated, scientifically trained people, and so it's not surprising that when they heard rumors or if they even saw pieces of strange hardware, that they invented stories about them and thought they were seeing something truly wild. The story continued. Mac Brazel called the Army Air Corps base and was put in touch with Colonel William Blanchard, commander of the 509th Bomb Group, the same outfit that had dropped the atom bomb on Japan. Colonel Blanchard assigned his intelligence officer, Major Jesse Marcel, to investigate. Major Marcel and one of his cohorts came out, spent the night out here in this little shack and got up the next morning and went out to the debris field. The next morning, the rancher takes him out to this stuff. And Jesse couldn't understand. Normally, if you have a plane crash, there's a crater. And then the wreckage gets, you know, blown all over the place. Stanton Friedman has a passion for UFO-related stories. He claims to be the first civilian ever to investigate the Roswell incident. In fact, he authored a book about it and believes there's convincing evidence that something strange did happen. There was no crater, so it had to be an upper air accident, explosion. But he couldn't find anything conventional. This is what bugged him. I mean, airplanes have standard pieces, you know, whether it's rivets or pieces of metal or electronic tubes or wiring. There was nothing like that anywhere. Major Marcel brought pieces of the wreckage back to Roswell Army Airfield and reported to Colonel Blanchard, who personally inspected the material. Walter Hout, then a 25-year-old public information officer, was stationed at the Roswell base. The next day, Colonel Blanchard called me into his office and told me they wanted me to put out a press release. In essence, that we had in our possession a flying saucer that had crashed up north in 
uh, west of Roswell and that it was being flown to Fort Worth to be turned over to General Ramey. And that was the end of it. But that was far from the end of it. Within hours, the Roswell story circled the globe. The headlines screamed, flying saucer falls to Earth. Reporters called from such faraway cities as London and Los Angeles. Every year, Roswell, New Mexico gets a healthy influx of tourists, including college kids who come here on their spring break, hoping for a lively encounter with anything alien. This is our Roswell visitors as an alien tourist. We have a lot of tourists that come into town. They want a memento from Roswell. They identify with this little guy as being the tourist. They say, okay, he crashed in 1947, he's just visiting. So we called him the Roswell Visitor. A simple stroll up Main Street is all it takes to make you feel right at home. Stop in at any one of the local shops and you'll find they cater to the needs of the most discriminating space traveler. Star Child originally became a concept in 1992. It was a joke between me and my sister-in-law, uh, and I did a little sculpture on a, on a board and made a refrigerator magnet out of it of a crashed spaceship, called it the UFO Incident Roswell. Boom, they started to sell, and we've sold thousands of them since then. We started building a larger and larger inventory of different sculptures and different artworks, and eventually started to sell to the UFO Museum. Just down the street from Star Child is the alien zone where you can have your picture taken with extraterrestrial imposters. It's a fun place that looks at the lighter side of Roswell's fame. The people who live in Roswell today don't seem to mind these frivolous alien encounters. But back in 1947, the mood was far more serious. Headlines about flying saucers topped newspapers everywhere because the U.S. Army had just issued a press release. An unknown craft had crashed outside Roswell. It was only two or three short paragraphs, and basically it said that uh, wreckage of a unidentified flying object had been discovered on a ranch northwest of Roswell, and it was attributed to Colonel William Blanchard, the base commander. Word spread fast. The phone had already started ringing off the wall. People all over the world were concerned about these reported sightings of saucers. And here I am, an editor of a little country daily newspaper, and I'd never talked to Paris Match or the London Times or I hardly knew where Hong Kong or, or Singapore was located. It just it was like a, a snowball. It just grew and grew and grew. We made headlines and radio. There were a lot of them just interrupted their programming and gave the information that uh, we had in our possession of flying saucer. Then, just 24 hours after the story hit the papers, it was over. It was all a mistake, the Army said. What was thought to be a flying saucer was in fact only a weather balloon. It died pretty fast. I think the main reason was the fact that uh, General Ramey got out a press release post haste which stated that uh, we were wrong. It was not anything fantastic, it was just a weather balloon. And if the general says it's a weather balloon, guess what? It's a weather balloon. UFO authors like Stanton Friedman think the world was duped. The notion that the people at the Roswell Army Airfield, the home of the only atomic bombing group in the world, couldn't recognize a weather balloon and radar reflector when everybody there was familiar with the use of such things is absurd. According to newspaper reports, the weather balloon story came through this man, Thomas DuBose, in 1947, he was the chief of staff to Brigadier General Roger Ramey. Ramey worked alongside General Clements McMullen, who was based at the Pentagon. This rare interview with DuBose was recorded on home video two years prior to his death in 1992. The debris or the elements were to be placed in a suitable container, and that Blanchard was to see that they were delivered 
to McMullen in Washington. And that was, uh, and that nobody, I must stress this, that no one was to discuss this with their wife, me, with Rainey, with anyone. The matter, as far as we're concerned, was closed at, as of that moment when that was it. This is more than top secret, as he said it. Beyond that. I think it's entirely reasonable that they might say that this is more than top secret because we didn't want Stalin to know what we knew about his atomic bomb program and their hydrogen bomb program. This was, after all, right after the end of World War II. So there was a lot of reason to be extremely nervous and to try to cover up with as much secrecy as possible any information that might possibly be the slightest advantage to Stalin. DuBose, who was closest to the inner circles of Roswell's top brass, said in this interview that he was ordered by General McMullen to get the press off our backs and then to forget the entire incident. When McMullen told me to forget it, I forgot it, and, and there wasn't anything else for me to do. I wasn't, I was, a, a, and so was Raymond. We were people of my era. When you were told something, you did it. And uh, hell, I was in the, one of the three people that had the top secret clue for the atomic bomb in the headquarters Air Force. After the Army's denial, Colonel Blanchard was left to face the press and explain how he could have mistaken a weather balloon for a flying saucer. According to Stanton Friedman, however, his career didn't suffer at all. Colonel Blanchard went on to become a four-star general by the time he was 48. When he died of a massive heart attack at the Pentagon in 1966, he was the vice chief of staff of the United States Air Force. Colonel Blanchard and I were, were close personal friends. As a matter of his own interest, he knew the editors of the paper, and because I had been a naval aviator in World War II, we struck up probably a stronger friendship than maybe some of the others. Several weeks later, maybe months later, we were together, and it was fairly quiet, and it was late, and we'd had a lot to drink, and he said, well, I'll tell you this, what I saw I've never seen before and I'll never see again. Well, I sobered up in a hurry, as a good newsman would, and, uh, but he would, he would never say anything more, and he never did. When somebody reports that they've seen something the likes of which they've never seen and will never see again, it, boy, it sure sounds spooky, but what does that really mean? Physicist Tom McDonough and Michael Shermer, publisher of Skeptic Magazine, both believe that back then the Roswell witnesses didn't really know what they saw. It's easy to jump to the conclusion that just because this fellow had not seen that kind of apparatus before, that it was alien apparatus. That doesn't mean it at all. There are all kinds of strange apparatus that you will find in any good laboratory that the average person or the average soldier would not recognize if they walked into the lab. When the weather balloon story was released, interest in the Roswell mystery virtually disappeared. As time passed, people talked less and less about it. Eventually, they stopped talking about it altogether. Roswell, the town that overnight had gone from Sleepy Town, USA to center of the universe, went back to sleep until 31 years later when one man came forward with an incredible story. In 1978, Major Jesse Marcel, long retired and in ill health, decided to reveal what he claimed was the truth. Jesse was the Army intelligence officer who'd been assigned the job of investigating the crash back in 47. This is an excerpt from an interview done by WWL-TV in New Orleans, Louisiana, one of the few television interviews Marcel granted. I was amazed at what I saw. The amount of debris was scattered over such an area. It took me a while to realize that there's something strange about it. But uh, the more I saw the fragments, the more I realized that uh, it wasn't anything that I, that I was acquainted with. In fact, that, as it turned out, nobody else was acquainted with it. What it was, I don't know. I still don't know. Despite the official explanation issued by the Army, Jesse did not believe that what he saw was the wreckage of a weather balloon. I proved I tried to burn it, it wouldn't burn. I, I, I tried to break it, it would not break. If any of us were to see some of the advanced technologies being worked on by the Air Force and our government, 
of planes that are so far advanced over what any of us could have imagined in the 60s or 70s or even 80s, we might look at that and say, that looks like it's out of this world. Following his investigation of the crash site, Jesse allegedly brought pieces of the wreckage home and showed it to his family. On the floor of the kitchen, there was a lot of metallic debris, nondescript material, but uh, things I'd never seen before. There was I-beams with a little bit of lettering on the inside of it, uh, some thin metal debris like torn up Alcoa wrap. A little more dull than that, though. I thought, wow, what is this, you know? And especially the I-beam. And I noticed there's some purplish uh, figures on the inside surface of this beam. And they look like geometric symbols, certainly no uh, alphabet that I've ever seen before. In Jesse Marcel Jr.'s mind, the sight of those metal scraps is still vivid. We looked at it for about 10 or 15 minutes, uh, oohed and awed over it, and then I helped him load it back into the car, and uh, I went back to bed and he went off to the air base, and I didn't see him back till the next day or the day after. Based on his memories of the debris, Jesse Jr. had a replica made of the strange I-beam. He can't explain it, and he can't forget its distinct markings. This is what I recall uh, the I-beam looked like on the kitchen floor that night. Don't know whether the ends were cleanly cut or fractured, but the most unusual feature of this uh, beam was the writing or the symbols that was along the inner surface of it. Uh, they're purplish, violet hue of various type of geometric forms and shapes, none of which made any sense to me except the one that looked like a seal balancing a ball on its head. After Marcel Sr. went public with his recollections, the town of Roswell, New Mexico quickly began to get famous again. And as it would turn out, Jesse wasn't going to be the last person to come forward with astonishing claims of strange sightings. For every UFO fan, the highlight of a trip to Roswell, New Mexico may very well be this place. Because as you might expect from the UFO capital of the world, Roswell has a museum completely dedicated to unidentified flying objects. The museum was founded for people to learn about UFOs and the UFO phenomena, to have a clearinghouse or a central location for people to come and learn about UFOs, tell their stories. The International UFO Museum and Research Center is open to believers and skeptics alike. We probably have, I would guess, an average of five to 10 sightings a week that are called in or from visitors that are here. They go around the museum and then look and say, you've got pictures of everything except the craft I saw. And then we refer them to the library where they will do a sighting report. Highlights of a museum tour include the map room, where sightings reported anywhere in the world are tracked, the library, and the exhibit areas such as the Roswell Air Base display, and of course, a wing dedicated to the Roswell UFO incident. Late this afternoon, a bulletin from New Mexico suggested that the widely publicized mystery of the flying saucers may soon be solved. These sections include some of the most notable UFO collectibles and photographs ever displayed. We have tourists, we have uh, different researchers, we have lots of film crews, lots of uh, people coming in to do documentaries, quite a few authors that come in to do research. A lot of people are just driving through Roswell and go, oh, we want to stop there. They stop because the stories about the Roswell mystery remain intriguing to this day. After Jesse Marcel Sr., the Army intelligence officer assigned to investigate the strange crash, went public in 1978 with his recollections, more people came forward with incredible stories, and so did the skeptics. It started with a little nucleus of Cold War secrecy. Over the years, uh, that little nucleus of Cold War paranoia has grown into an interesting story that is probably 99% false. While no one denied that something had crashed in the desert that night, they did not agree on what it was. What I think happened at Waswell is that it was a balloon designed to listen for acoustic waves from Soviet atomic bomb explosions. A physicist Tom McDonough wants to believe in flying saucers. He just hasn't seen any convincing evidence that they exist, at least not yet. As the coordinator of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, He's on a hunt for life on other planets, but he believes that whatever crashed to Earth near Roswell took off from Earth. 
Apparently, a device was built that was carried up in a balloon, and it was designed to listen for these signals, and it then crashed in the desert. It was a top secret experiment, and so the military didn't want anyone to know about it. In fact, McDonough contends the design of the balloon explained some of the strange markings Roswell residents claim they saw on the so-called crash debris. It turns out that we actually know what that was. Once the real balloon story was declassified several years ago, we learned that some packing strips had been used in the assembly of this balloon that were from a commercial plant that produced strips uh, that had decorative markings on them that looked sort of like hieroglyphs, and that is almost certainly what he saw. There were a lot of things that under national security were top secret that you're not supposed to talk about. That doesn't make it extraterrestrial. Michael Shermer is the publisher of Skeptic Magazine, and he holds a doctorate in the history of science. He does not characterize himself as a believer. I think this whole thing is a byproduct, in part, initially, of the Cold War, and then it took on a life of its own. Dr. Shermer and other skeptics say the military can blame themselves for the scrutiny. Remember that press release that said a flying saucer had crashed to Earth? It put the story on page one. I suspect that there was some cover-up and some sort of funny stuff going on with the government initially because they do stuff like that when it's related to uh, security. So, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that there was some funky stuff going on. Both sides agree that the government engaged in a cover-up, but not about what. Part of the problem with Roswell is that the original government story of a crashed weather balloon uh, w was not true. So is it possible that the government lies about things? Yes, it is. In fact, the stage was set before the Roswell incident even happened. In early summer 1947, newspapers and radio stations told of an unusually high number of UFO sightings being reported in North America. One such account came from a pilot named Kenneth Arnold. The Kenneth Arnold sighting was the source of the very phrase that has become so endearing to most people within the UFO field, flying saucers. He described these nine crescent-shaped objects over Yakima, Washington on June 24th of 1947, just 10 days before Roswell. But again, most interesting was the fact that they were not saucer-shaped, but shaped like a crescent moon, more wing-shaped. The actual first 10 witnesses at Roswell they, too, did not describe the recovered vehicle, the ship, as saucer-shaped, but rather as a wing, rather almost like a crescent moon. The Roswell story continued to change. Three decades after the mystery first surfaced, the military continued to battle rumors as more people came forward with astonishing claims of strange sightings that night in 1947. One such witness was allegedly a young man named Jim Ragsdale. His story can't be verified, but according to Roswell resident Charles Walker, Ragsdale told him and dozens of other people that he and his girlfriend were camping in the Pine Lodge area of Lincoln National Forest, 20 miles from the spot where Mac Brazel first found the debris. There, they stumbled upon what appeared to be the point of impact. The top of the aircraft was embedded right in here. And Jim Ragsdale pointed out that there was a cracked rock. He figured at first uh, thought was, man, it was a heavy impact because it cracked the boulder. He noticed some, some what he at first thought were debris. As he approached it, he found out that they were midget bodies, human-type bodies. That was when they heard the military vehicles approaching, and it scared them, and they left. On the night of July 4th, radar technicians at the White Sands testing grounds recorded what appeared to be an enormous crash on their radar screens. Frank Kaufman, an intelligence expert, was in the control room at the time. This is the last interview Mr. Kaufman granted before he died in early 2001. All of a sudden, the screen just lit up, just blasted right up in light. And uh, we didn't know what that was. Frank Kaufman says he was part of the intelligence team sent to investigate the crash. All we saw was a glow, and we didn't know what it was. 
But the closer we got to it, the shape began to shape up, see? And there was no round disc. It was shaped kind of like a T-bird, like this shape, see? My name is Frankie Rowe. I am the daughter of Dan Dwyer, who was a fireman here in Roswell, who went to the crash site the morning of the crash. Frankie Rowe was just 12 years old when she claims her father told her that he too had seen the mysterious wreck. What daddy saw that day was the actual uh, flying saucer. Frankie claims she then remembers going to see her father at the fire station two days after the incident, and that there, lying on a table, was a piece of the debris. I realized you could wad it up and not even feel it in your hand, although loose, it covered all of your hand. It was so soft that it was almost, it felt non-existent. And when you dropped it, it was liquid like water that the wrinkles were gone. My biggest thought was, I wish my dad's shirts were made of material like this so I didn't have to iron them. And none of these stories sway the skeptics. Frank Kaufman was convinced he saw something that had come from outer space, but they insist his story actually supports the military's explanation, that what crashed wasn't extraterrestrial, just high tech. This was some kind of a crashed object. Everyone agrees on that, and damage undoubtedly occurred, whatever it was. And so it's not inconsistent with the idea that it was a secret experiment of the Air Force that happened to crash and was damaged. But Frank Kaufman didn't just claim he saw a wrecked spaceship. He said he also saw alien bodies. By 1947, intelligence officer Frank Kaufman was already a fixture in the military. He'd survived World War II, and he thought he'd seen everything. Until July of 1947, when he claimed he arrived at a mysterious crash site in Roswell. Fifty years after the fact, Kaufman maintained he vividly recalled what he believes was a crashed spaceship and alien creatures. We saw one person or one individual, one alien, I mean, leaning up against the Arroyo. The other one was half in, half out. And so we had to wait <coughs> till the chemical unit got out there <coughs> to verify that it was safe to get close. William Woody, then 13 years old, claims he and his father saw the crash from their kitchen window and rushed to the scene. We drove up the, through there with the truck and at that time, the Air Force, they had a man on sentry on every exit fence line road and wouldn't let us go in. They definitely knew something was there, but they seemed to be confused exactly where it was at. William Woody says he and his father were told to leave immediately. Meanwhile, Kaufman says his unit was loading the alien life forms onto flatbeds. The first to go was the aliens because we noticed deterioration was setting in on the skin. They were sending the base ambulance to the base hospital. Kaufman alleged that everything from the crash site was taken in complete secrecy and under heavy military escort to the Roswell Air Base. We designated Hangar 84 for the other materials. We kept one, one alien out so that they could, he could be, or he or she or whatever they were, could be examined and uh, we were told that they were not of this world. Did Kaufman really see alien bodies, or was there another terrestrial explanation? It's possible he saw uh, test dummies, or perhaps people that had been experimentally parachuting from high altitudes, monkeys that were used experimentally who had their hair singed off and they looked kind of alien-like. Uh, any, any of those are entirely possible. Hangar 84 still looks much the same as it did then. UFO author Don Schmidt says he spoke to people who claimed they saw alien bodies laid out here shortly after the alleged crash. Witnesses have described how the entire floor of the hangar was flagged off or was roped off and different segments of the object would be contained in this area and the bodies would be lined up in another area with a canvas tarpaulin over the top of them. And as one of the intelligence officers said to us, 
They sure weren't from Texas. You can read the alleged eyewitness accounts in Schmidt's book, UFO Crash at Roswell, but skeptics see issues in the timing. The story of alien bodies at Roswell is funny because it doesn't appear in the earliest accounts. It occurred years later. And what probably happened was there was another set of experiments that was being done in which the Air Force was dropping dummies out of airplanes to see how much damage they would sustain in falling. And that may well have been the source of all these stories about aliens at Roswell. Tom McDonough is a physicist and senior scientist of the Skeptic Society and coordinator of SETI. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence at the Planetary Society, the international organization founded by astronomer Carl Sagan. He believes the Roswell eyewitnesses don't really know what they saw. I think many of the people who are witnesses are simply misidentifying what they saw. I don't think that they're necessarily lying, but they don't understand what it is that they saw, and it was probably something a lot less exciting than what they're claiming. People incorporate into their memories images from other sources. Memory is not like a videotape where you rewind it and play it back and watch it. It doesn't work that way. So there is the original memory of whatever it is you saw, and even that's fully tainted with emotions and other biases that enter in, and then it's grafted on for decades of uh, other sources. What I would like to see is some kind of really solid, repeatable scientific proof, and I don't know of any such proof from a UFO incident. While these provocative stories continue to attract thousands of people to Roswell every year, the city isn't just about tiny creatures from outer space. For a dose of Earth history and American culture, check out the Roswell Museum and Arts Center. The Roswell Museum and Arts Center is one of the greatest museums in the Southwest. It has a little bit of everything. It has art, it's got history, it's got space science. A renowned, internationally significant collection of Robert H. Goddard's work. Goddard was here in Roswell for 11 years doing his experimental research in liquid-fueled rocketry. We also have a wonderful collection that is known as the Aston Collection of American Indian and Western Art. It's a fabulous collection which includes Plains Indian materials, westward expansion materials of the Euro-Americans, and it's also got materials from Spanish conquest in New Mexico. The Roswell Museum is known for a fantastic fine arts collection that includes the regionalists Peter Hurd and Henriette Wyeth. We have the largest collection in the United States of their works. If it's the great outdoors you crave, the Roswell area boasts 24,000 acres of wildlife refuge. The area known as Bitter Lakes was established in 1930 as a refuge for migratory birds and is home to many unique species. Most of our wintering waterfowl will arrive in uh, October or November. Uh, we usually peak around Thanksgiving with 15 to 20,000 uh, white geese, which are the snows and the rosses, and seven or 8,000 sandhill cranes. Best time to be here uh, is certainly in the winter time. Another outdoor highlight is the Bottomless Lakes State Park just outside of Roswell. In the summertime, this place is packed. We sit on the northernmost boundaries of the Chihuahuan Desert. So we're very thankful to have uh, this water-based recreation here. And good place to come and swim and cool off during a hot summer months. And uh, a place to get out and, and do some trout fishing, which is normally a, a cold water uh, species and sport. But uh, here during the wintertime, we have some real good trout fishing. If just thinking about a plate full of pan-fried trout makes you hungry, you don't have to leave Roswell. Some of the best eats in the Southwest are just a few blocks in either direction. People, when they come to Roswell, uh, are definitely looking for two different types of food. They're looking for the local fare of Mexican food, or they're looking for a great steak. Locals tell us for the best steak in town, Cattle Baron should be at the top of your list. The steaks here are hand cut. Filet mignon, New York strip, top sirloin, porterhouse, and of course the prime rib. We kicked around the idea of offering a, an alien-oriented food product. Um, I don't know that a green hamburger would probably sit well on a plate. People from this part of the country like their food spicy, which means they put chili peppers on almost everything. And if you think one chili is just like another, think again. Just ask Joe, the owner and chef at Popo's Restaurant. He'll tell you the best chilies are grown right here in Roswell. Don't believe him? 
Then just try the most popular plate on the menu, which is... Probably 30 to 35 percent of our plates would have to be an enchilada, be it chicken, be it beef, cheese, whatever. You can always tell when it's payday because people uh, spend a little bit more and get the combo. Located at the south end of Main Street is the Roswell Industrial Air Center. During the Cold War, bombers carrying nuclear payloads took off from this base heading for their fail-safe points between here and the Soviet Union. But what else went on here more than half a century ago? The answer to that, it would seem, depends on who you ask and who you believe. Did aliens crash in the desert? Or did a top secret spy gadget go out of control? It's been more than a half century since the mysterious Roswell crash, but visitors are still curious about what happened in the sky above the New Mexico desert in 1947. The reminders are everywhere, and so are the UFO enthusiasts. Author Jim Mars wrote Alien Agenda, a best-selling book on flying saucers. He alleges that from the beginning, the government covered up the crash of an alien spacecraft, and that as recently as 1994, they were still covering it up. First, initially, the guys on the scene who were there, they said, we've got a flying saucer. Higher echelons said, oh, no, no, no. It was just a weather balloon. Later, they admitted the weather balloon story was a lie. So they said, OK, well, what it really was was a top secret thing. It was Project Mogul. Project Mogul also involved balloons. These carried a listening device designed to spy on the USSR and detect sounds generated by the detonation of atomic bombs. But only a few years later, in the summer of 1997, the Air Force issued a new explanation for the Roswell controversy crash test dummies used to simulate pilots ejecting from high-altitude spy planes. UFO enthusiasts weren't satisfied, although there is no clear verification. They claim there were no crash dummy tests until 1954. What are we left with? They got a flying saucer. To make such arguments, UFOologists point to a variety of accounts from a variety of sources including eyewitness reports, second-hand accounts, the U.S. government, and themselves. To the skeptics, that doesn't prove anything. The citations and sources used by ufologists are just notoriously incestuous. They just cite each other. This is classic friend of a friend. It's urban legend time. Dr. Michael Shermer wrote the book, The Borderlands of Science. He maintains that all the questions have been answered with fact, not fiction. We do know uh, what these projects were all about. They published a whole book on, uh, on these projects, so I'm not sure what the mystery is there. Twice, first in 1994 and then again in 1997, the military released its findings on the Roswell incident in two separate and detailed reports. The 97 report revealed from the Air Force that uh, they had been conducting a, a secret experiment during the Cold War. They were really listening for acoustic signals from Soviet nuclear explosions, and that they had covered up this, so they revealed the previous cover-up, that the weather balloon story was not the true story. This version of events is reportedly backed by people who were part of the top secret project, including Charles B. Moore, one of three surviving Project Mogul scientists identified in the Air Force report. Some of the people who actually built the balloon have discussed how they built it and where they built it and the different pieces of apparatus they used. And so uh, it seems to me pretty convincing that we know what that Roswell balloon really was. And that wasn't a UFO, it was a balloon. No doubt something peculiar happened near Roswell on July 4th, 1947. The ultimate answer as to what may lie in a top secret military program known as the Black Projects. Black Projects were ordained immediately after World War II. Within the Black Budget, they're able to fly some of the most highly advanced aircraft, whether we're talking about the SR-71, the Blackbird, our most famous spy plane for over 30 years, or stealth technology, for example. 
In fact, witnesses have seen stealth fighter planes soaring above New Mexico. But more than 50 years ago, the military flew test flights in these same skies with the stealth fighter's predecessor, a futuristic-looking crescent-shaped aircraft called the Flying Wing. But for people like Stanton Friedman, those explanations don't answer all the questions. If you were to ask me, are some UFOs secret government vehicles? Of course. So what? That's the wrong question. The question isn't, are all UFOs alien spacecraft? Are any? Today, Roswell, New Mexico looks just like Will Rogers once described it, the prettiest town in the West. Not the type of place you'd associate with flying saucers or creatures from another planet. And yet every year, tourists keep coming to hear the stories and to decide for themselves what might have happened here in 1947. As for the witnesses, they remain convinced they saw something extraterrestrial, no matter what the skeptics say. In talking with my dad years later about this, he never wavered one iota as to what he thought it was. It was always, to him, uh, something that came from outer space. And knowing what I saw, I have to agree with that. I know that my father would not have lied about it. I know being there, how everyone else reacted. I know the excitement in the town. I know how I felt when I handled the material. What would I gain by making up a cockamamie story of this kind, especially with the, with the damn Army, military, Navy, Marines, and everybody else to back them up? So, yes, it happened. Now, whether you believe it or not, that's your problem. We need really solid proof. We need to be able to talk to an alien, or we need to have uh, some piece of alien hardware, an alien radio, or something like that that we can uh, experiment with and verify that really wasn't made using human technology. It's not impossible that aliens have come here. It's just no evidence for it. Look, here's the bottom line. These guys have had 50 years now of blurry photographs, grainy videos, and anecdotes about things that crashed in Farmer Bob's field at 3 in the morning in Puckerbrush, Kansas. I've had enough of these stories. Show me the body, show me the spacecraft, or go home.